So sin is missing the mark in a relationship based on the expectations of that relationship. Okay? So, this could be something as simple as, Yahweh says, you shall have no other mighty ones before me. So when you go into idolatry and you have another God before him, this is breaching the expectation of the relationship. It could also be much more mundane. Let's say you, as a man, promised your wife she could retire and not work when she married you, and you didn't do that. That's a sin. Huh? How could that? You breached an expectation of relationship. It's not a sin according to Torah commands, but you created an expectation that you missed the mark. In this case, the case of the relationship with Elohim, the expectations are set by Elohim alone. We don't get to set expectations for him. So this is a unilateral thing. He's going to just make all the expectations and we either agree or we don't agree. As a matter of fact, we have to agree not even knowing what they all are. Because he asked them to do that in Exodus 19 before he actually told them what the expectations are. My expectation is you're just going to trust and do everything I say. All right? And then he said, but you can expect if you do that, everything would be better than you could ever imagine. And anybody agree with that? I agree with that. Trusting in him has life being better than I ever could have imagined. Sin, again, it's a breach of relationship. In other words, we're falling short of or missing the mark of an expectation in the relationship. So some of you, you don't understand why your spouse is all mad at you because you're sinning. What? You're falling short of an expectation that they have. And you may be thinking, but I never set the expectation. Well, that doesn't matter. You're struggling because the other person assumed that you had the same expectation. And that's why you need to sit down and talk about it. I've had husbands and wives sit down and talk to me and say things like, well, you know, he never blah, 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 or she does it. And then they one that looks at the other and goes, well, what do you mean? I never offered you that. <laughs> I never promised you that. What do you mean you never promised that? I expect, well, I don't know why you expected that. I never said anything because that's what their parent did or their father did or their mother did. Well, that's what they saw the role of the husband or the wife. The being that is sinning shall die. The being that sins. Okay, by the way, it may say in some translations, the soul that sins, because this is from the Hebrew nephesh. It simply means a living being, okay? So this is where we, I, used, I did a part of a teaching where I said killing the immortal soul. I think that's actually Millennium and Kingdom part four, which doesn't exist. Okay, but anyway, that's an inside joke. But uh, the section of the idea is that, you know, this idea of an immortal soul. There's a part of you that does get stored for the kingdom that is in existence that's connected with him that will then be put in a body. But when we talk about the immortal soul, and we use that word soul, it comes from a place where it says the soul that sins dies. Okay? The being that sins dies. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall certainly die. His blood is upon himself. So all of you need to knock off this, I'm all miserable because my parents, blah, blah, blah. This, stop that. At some point, you take off your diaper, you take the thumb out of your mouth or anywhere else, and you walk on your hind legs and own your life. That's what adults do. They own all of their life. Oh, I just, God, no, stop that, okay? Yes, there's a creator, and the creator owns you, but you have to own your life. You're responsible for your choices. Stop blaming your, I was raised this way, and I, I had this happen to me when I was a child, and, and I grew up in this neighborhood. And Stop blaming everything. Own your life. The wrong, verse 21, if he turns from all his breach of relationship, his sins, which he's done and shall guard my laws. So turning your life around now brings a new status. You shall certainly live. Now, some of you think, well, where's Yeshua fit in all this? Well, this is talking about life in general, needing still the death of Messiah, which hadn't happened yet, but was going to happen, to pay the price that ultimately still needed to be paid because of our sin. So for those that do not do this, death is all they get. 
Yeshua, we're going to read when we get to talk more about Yeshua, now makes possible a new endpoint called eternal life. When a righteous one turns away from his righteousness, see, they're upset that a righteous one is not like righteous. Oh, he's not once saved, always saved. There it is right there. You're welcome, all you Baptists. I just freed you from that nonsense. He says, you're going to be judged on all that you're doing at the end. Not every little piece of the process along the way, but where do you end up? Do you end up in, the righteous one ended up in a bad place and the bad one ended up in the right place in terms of his relationship behaviors, and they were receiving according to where they ended up, not where they started. Praise Yah for that. I don't think any of us started very well. Okay? <laughs> I'll speak for myself, but I know that most of us did not start very well. So praise Yah that that's not being held against us. What saved them in Ezekiel 18? What merited the favor? Behaving rightly, or righteously, right? Doing right ruling, obeying the Torah, submitting to, guarding, and keeping. See, if you understood that, you know what he's talking about in Ephesians 2. Because in Ephesians 2, they're going to say, oh, no, it's just by grace, and they didn't have to do anything. No. They knew nothing at the beginning of the chapter, and then they came to have a relationship, and in the relationship, they, look, if you want to marry Yeshua, you better figure out what his expectations are. If you love me, keep my commandments. I mean, he tells you right out what his expectations are. And then you're looking around in your book for the red letters. Well, everywhere it said, thus said Yahweh, go put red letters. And don't start in Matthew, start in Genesis, okay? All churches, all Judeo-Christian groups talk about sin. They do. Absolutely no doubt about it. And they're all, I believe this without any doubt, all agree that we shouldn't sin. They do. They don't understand what it is, though. Especially the New Testament Christian types. Because sin is a breach of a relationship that has set expectations. And those expectations have been written for you in very clear terms, in more than one spot, multiple places. Do you know, if you read, that's funny, if you read the Torah portions each week, especially when we get to Exodus 19 and forward, and how many thousands of times he says, if you will guard, if you will do, guard, keep, observe, remember. I looked, I sought after somebody. See, some of you, you know what you are today? This is back in Ezekiel's day. You know what you are today? You're that somebody, maybe, if you're standing in the breach. Because some of you are thinking, oh, but my family's being so mean and my former church, are, are you standing in the breach? You know why he couldn't find anybody to stand in the breach? Because it wasn't easy to do. Standing in the breach is a rough job to do. Because if you think about the picture of the breach, it's like the kid with his thumb in the hole and the dam is bursting. Okay, you're going to stand against a flood, a torrent of stuff. Are you willing to stand there and hold that closed and say, this stops here. It's the idea of standing in the breach. <laughs>